thank you, Dinesh, and thank you, Mohammed, for inviting me to. Uh, in this talk on cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, I first need to acknowledge Sam Lee, who originally described the condition, and Kim Watt, my colleagues, and I've used some of their slides in this presentation. So this is the take-home message. We have to look at all different connections between the liver and the kidney. So we have hepatic manifestations of cardiac disease. We have cardiac manifestations of liver disease. We have cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, which I'll discuss in a little more detail. I thought I'd also talk about pre-transplant cardiac evaluation and what are the post-transplant cardiac problems that these patients have. So the hepatic manifestations of cardiac disease are Drugs are very common in cardiac patients. Viral hepatitis, especially if they've been multiple transfusions and they've had surgery when they were children. Transfusion-related iron overload. Congestive heart failure gives you both acute and chronic changes within the liver. Ischemic hepatitis and congenital heart disease. The cardiac manifestations of liver disease are a little more complex. So the cardiovascular abnormalities noted in patients with cirrhosis and portal hypertension include the hyperdynamic circulation, there's portosystemic shunting, there's abnormal cerebrovascular flow, there's hepatopulmonary syndrome and portopulmonary hypertension, which was just discussed. There's the heptorenal syndrome, and then there's cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. So cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, these are the key points, and we'll discuss each of these in a little more detail. If you look very carefully in patients with advanced liver disease, certainly more than 50% of them will have some cardiac manifestation. This would be manifest either as, abdom as abnormal cardiac function at rest or impaired contractile response to stress. There's altered diastolic relaxation, and this is detected by the EA ratio. E is early filling, and A is the filling of the ventricle with atrial contraction. Normally, E is more than A, and we'll talk about that. There's a prolonged QT interval in almost all these patients. Previously, it was thought cirrhotic cardiomyopathy is part of alcoholic liver disease, but we know now it's independent of etiology of liver disease, and it's certainly involved in the development of hepatorenal syndrome. And the treatment is nonspecific and it seems to resolve after liver transplantation. So if there's one message you need to take home is don't get too worried about it. If you're going to transplant these patients, it's going to get better. So cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, the first mention of this is Sam Lee in 1989. But if you look at the literature, so this is a paper way back in 1969. So these were patients who were diagnosed as having alcoholic fatty liver, so these were called non-cardiacs, and Reagan infused fluid in them, and he noted, if you can see from the slide, that even though the left ventricle and diastolic volume almost tripled, cardiac output did not rise, and so he realized that patients with liver disease had cardiac dysfunction. Subsequently, it was noted that diastolic dysfunction seemed to have been common, much more in patients with liver disease. So the normal EA ratio is above one, and in patients with cirrhosis, it tends to be below that. There's also the deceleration time. This is the time from the peak of the E wave till you come down to the baseline. Normally, it's 200 to 220 seconds, so under 200 is, is normal, and you see patients with cirrhosis tend to have in the increase in the deceleration time. Later, Mauro Bernardi described the QTC prolongation in cirrhosis. And if you look at advanced liver disease, QTC prolongation is, again, almost universal. But again, don't worry too much about these because fatal ventricular arrhythmias are not common in these groups of patients. A paper from Florence Wong, if you look at the three panels, the three panels are talking about heart rest, a heart rate at peak exercise, increase in the ejection fraction, an increase in the cardiac index. And there are three separate groups of patients who were studied. These were controls, pre-acytic cirrhosis, and ascites. So really normals, early cirrhosis, and late cirrhosis. And as you can see, there's a blunted chronotropic and inotropic response to exercise and stress, and this is worse in advanced cirrhosis. 
So really the heart rate decreases with time, the cardiac output also decreases with time, and so does the ejection fraction. Not only is there this problem, there's electromechanical dyssynchrony. So that means when you get electrical activity, the start of the QRS complex, that's the time the ventricle should contract. So you can do an electrocardiogram and an echocardiogram at the same time, and th this is how it was actually done. But there are newer catheters which actually help you decide that. And you can see there are problems in these patients. The, heart may, the ventricle may start contracting before or slightly after the QRS complex. What about TIPS and liver transplantation and cirrhotic cardiomyopathy? Again, the EA ratio is important in determining outcome of these patients. In the randomized controlled trials of TIPS versus paracentesis, 12% had overt cardiac failure, and I assume that these patients had underlying cardiomyopathy. In the liver transplant patients, post-transplant heart failure occurs in about 5 to 8 percent of patients. We'll talk about what the causes might be a little later. And if you look at the patients who have undergone a TIPS, and you look at carefully, if you look at the x-rays, you'll see evidence of pulmonary edema in these patients, but ultimately this also resolves. So in spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, this was a study which was done from Spain, and in them, they found that once patients had hepatorenal syndrome, so these are the patients who came with SPP, they had cardiac function checked, then they got the infection, they tried to see what would happen. And they showed that once you got renal failure, before you got renal failure, there was a decrease in cardiac output. And that is shown in these panels in here. You can see B is after the adrenal insufficiency, A is before, and you can see cardiac output and mean arterial pressure dropped. The editorial on this by Sam Lee suggested that this might be cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, but you know that septic shock and sepsis also can cause the similar picture. Uh, from Alex Kraw from Denmark, decrease in cardiac index, again associated with diminished survival. So all this evidence points to the heart being involved in cirrhosis. Last talk was on heptorenal syndrome, and if you look at our current understanding of heptorenal syndrome, there's a decrease in the effect of arterial blood volume because of vasodilatation, and traditionally we've not talked about the heart, because if you've got a decrease in the effect of heart volume, effect of arterial blood volume, then the heart should kick in, and in these patients the heart does not kick in, and so there is a role for cirrhotic cardiomyopathy in heptorenal syndrome. So to summarize the renal changes in early ascites versus long-standing ascites and heptorenal syndrome, there's a decrease in the heart rate, there's a decrease in the stroke volume, and ultimately there's a decrease in the cardiac output. Having said all this, heart failure is actually quite rare in these patients because they've got peripheral vasodilatation, which is a good treatment for cardiac failure, and also there's a compensatory decrease in some of the inhibitory systems, which we will not discuss further. <coughs> What about intraoperatively? Is this a problem? There's a reduced ability to compensate for hemodynamic stresses, so systolic and diastolic dysfunction. So you might see a patient who you, you know, suddenly has a little difficulty in coming out. They have a prolongation in the QTC. They get atrial fibrillation. And because they have down regulation of beta-1 receptors, and we are putting these patients on beta blockers, there's an imp you know, impaired response to the usual doses of inotropes. So the recommendation in these patients is you'll have to use maybe higher doses, use norepinephrine for peripheral vasoconstriction, vasopressin for heart contractility, and maybe even methylene blue to counteract the nitric oxide. The unanswered question is we don't know about the natural history. The diagnostic criteria are still not very clear. You can use QTC, but I think echocardiogram is the best. Not sure about the management. There's a newer drug coming uh, uh, it's called serilaxin, which works both in the liver and the heart, and perhaps that might be useful in cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. And we really don't understand the mechanical uh, problems in these patients, and certainly we don't understand the molecular mechanisms involved here. What is a pre-transplant cardiac evaluation? In general, when I see patients, ask them to lose weight, stop smoking, most often we are unsuccessful.
I look at frailty in these patients. If you can walk five meters in five seconds, you're doing good. If you cannot do that, you're probably not a good candidate for transplant. That fails, we do a six minute walk test in these. If you cannot walk 250 meters in six minutes, you're probably not a good candidate for transplant. Once they pass this, then we would consider evaluation of coronary artery disease in specific risk groups. Now what applies to the general population for screening for coronary artery disease doesn't apply completely to patients with cirrhosis. So SPECT scanning is supposed to be the best exercise testing, uh, best stress testing in the general population as compared with coronary angiography for structural changes. But this study will show you that using SPECT scanning in patients with end-stage liver disease low sensitivity, you tend to miss a lot of coronary artery disease, but really it's, it's quite specific. So what are the other options? This is a study from one of our sister institutions. We use a dobutamine stress echocardiogram, but again, that's not very good in here. So if you look, looking from left to right, that's non-ischemic, indeterminate, and ischemic, that was the report on the stress. Look what the coronary catheterization showed. And so if you look at both together, if they had catheterization, which was moderate to severe coronary artery disease, stress testing was positive in half and was negative in half. So really the stress testing is not that good and we certainly need to do better. My colleague Kim Watt looks at and has written on troponin. We like troponin. Troponin below 0.07 is good. If you've got a cardiac history and a troponin of 0.07 and above, they are certainly going to be at risk for cardiovascular events post-transplant. What are the post-transplant cardiac problems in these patients? Patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, certainly at a higher risk than patients with alcoholic liver disease. And so about a fourth of patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease within the first year will have some cardiac event. And uh, the severe cardiac events are about 6%. So be careful about these patients. Your job does not end at the time of transplant. Make sure they're on statins. Make sure they lose weight. Make sure they're on aspirin post-transplant. Not only is cardiovascular events a concern in the first year, I think it's an even bigger concern beyond the first year. So if you look at deaths beyond the first year, hepatic causes are very unusual, or not very unusual, are less common, and they're related to recurrent disease. The major causes of deaths are non-hepatic. And if you look among the non-hepatic causes, then cardiovascular is about 20%. So lose weight, no smoking, aspirin, consider statins in many of these patients. And when we followed patients over time, in about 10 years, 30 to 40% have some cardiovascular disease. So what are the take home messages? Predominantly on cirrhotic cardiomyopathy because that was my task today. It's common in advanced cirrhosis. It's not due to alcohol. Stress test on echocardiogram is used for diagnosis. Consider this as a possibility when a person is on vasoconstrictors and is not responding too well. And it certainly affects the outcomes during stress. And that stress might be surgery, might be GI bleeding, might be infections, or when you're using vasoactive drug treatment. The appropriate management of these patients is not clear, but a new liver is going to improve the heart. Thank you.